Love that. This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, September 26, 2024. Um, our topic has already been represented as a Zoom wallpaper by Sam because we're backcasting from uh, futures that work and he's sitting in one, which is uh, the green city of his future. So, um, and I was just saying that I love that that the effect is even that he's sitting on a terrace in that city. The, the, the little terrace effect makes the whole thing really complete. Did you get this from a prompt? Yes. Yeah. Um, solar punk. Oh no, no, it's not from a prompt. It was, it was a Google search. Some kind of someone made this. Yeah. Oh, okay. it was a, yeah. I'm I mean, thinking... they might have they might have used a prompt, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm sitting here thinking, what would I have done to create that terrace effect? How would I have made? I don't know. These things are unruly. Creative and beautiful, but unruly. These new AIs. Um, hey, everybody. Um, I th Sam, I think if if I if you don't mind, I'd love to I'd love to ask you to restate your question to us just briefly to take us in. Um, I, we we haven't structured anything for this, but I'm I'm interested. I have my own, you know, thoughts on what this is. I kind of want to try to listen and and respond and see where we where we want to head with this. But uh, why don't you take us back in to the topic, if you would? Sure. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's a little on spot here, but I'll I'll do my best. Uh, <laughs> so I, I listened to all the governance calls. There was like basically five of them, and you know, just took some notes. And it, it seemed to me that there were a handful of topics that really interest pe interested people, including being, like analyzing platforms and, you know, for current governance, like Democrat versus Republican staff and et cetera. But one of them that really excited me and what I proposed, and it seems like there's some interest, that's why we're all here, is um, to envision, so to kind of like imagine what an ideal governance system, what a governance system would need to be able to do or how it would need to look for us to be able to solve the sort of wicked problems, the multipolar traps and the, the meta crisis and all the poly crisis and all, solve all the problems that we're facing. How would a governance system um, need to be structured to be able to handle those types of problems? And, you know, ideally for it to not suck, like for it not to be an authoritarian nightmare or some kind of feudal, you know, monstrosity. So. That, so there's the process of sort of envisioning that, and that might take a while. Um, but also there's this concept of backcasting. So once we have sort of in our minds what this would look like, and maybe we can get a lot of detail into how it could actually work. I mean, I've put tons of thought into it myself, and and I'm you know I'm always impressed by the members here. So many people here have also just been putting tons and tons of thought. So maybe we can kind of mash our heads together and come up with a, a sort of a detailed plan. And, um, and then once we have something that we feel like could work, like we know what we have couldn't work, it just couldn't work, like it just won't work. But something might. And so when we come up with something that could theoretically work, um, we can sort of backcast or imagine the steps that it would take for us to get there, what would have to have gone right? Um, like what decisions would have to have been made where for us to end up with that scenario? I think I'm thinking that's kind of how we're what this calls well. That's how I'm imagining this call. Um, Sam, I love that. I have a couple of thoughts on that, but before I color what you said, I just want to hear what reactions anyone else has uh, to that start. Um, I had, something's been bouncing in my head quite a bit as of late. Uh, Kahneman, before he passed away, um, had been working on, um, and that's Daniel Kahneman. I, I'm sure most of you have read him. Um, he, he'd been working on something very interesting, which was the understanding that when, when people try to answer a question, uh, that's complex, individuals typically don't get the right answer. And if you ask everybody to come to come together and actually negotiate an answer, the answer actually becomes worse. But if you ask everybody to come up with their own respective answer and not pollute their answer with other people's answers, and then you average out or triangulate all of the answers, that collective answer is much better 
than um, than the any one individual's answer. And so to me, it seems that there's a, there's an opportunity for these conversations to try to sort of mush everything together and find the right answer rather than saying there's these all these ideas, these different perspectives, and that those different perspectives all offer some insight that are that is unique. And rather than trying to mash it all together, that it's best for us to leave them as their own ideas and then as assemble them in some way that that recognizes that there there are unique views on it. So that that to me has been really resonating as of late uh, as a way to to bring together different ideas rather than uh, what we've done in the past, I think. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Jose. Um, Stuart. Thank you. I have a I, I have a response, but but before I, I, I share my response, I have to share an incident that happened this week very, very quickly. Um, I was at a dinner last week. Um, it's a group of us that meet quarterly, uh, one of whom was my dear friend Elizabeth Doty. And she said that she had learned something absolutely wonderful um, from this guy named Pete. <laughs> and then she sent me what she had learned with a picture of Pete. And I just roared on the floor. <laughs> Anyway, that's that's the little anecdote. That's the little anecdote. Um, but um, in response to the question, my agreement model. Well, before I get to the agreement model, um, Sharif Abdullah, in his wonderful work creating a world that works for all, in two thousand, said, "You know." Um, People are out there doing wonderful work. And one of the problems is with all the nonprofits, everybody thinks they have the answer as opposed to having a piece of the answer. And in, in my agreement model, um, it's cumulative. In other words, it's not about negotiation. It's about one, two, three, four, five as a cumulative vision for what it is that we want to um, create. Um, now, how do you translate that to large scale? You know, that's obviously one of the questions, but I just wanted to kind of validate the piece that um, Jose was making. Awesome, thank you. Um, other thoughts, uh, we have Pete. Who has now been referenced in another in another place? And I was just marveling that you knew Elizabeth uh, Stewart, and then you bring Pete into the same story. So it was like a triple. It was a triple word score story. I love that. And it reminded me that we were possibly going to do extremely brief check ins at the beginning of some of our topic calls, um, and that that was a that was exactly perfect for that kind of thing. Uh, so Pete, why don't you say what you're going to say, and then uh, we'll do a really quick quick round of, of check ins, and then go back to our queue. Uh, <clears throat> we'll do. <clears throat> uh, Elizabeth is great. Really like her. Um, uh, I I like Sam's framing uh, and thinking of governance, and I think we have to do it. And I think a thing to I I think two things you kind of want to remember. Uh, I, you can't. I I don't believe you can govern the whole system. Uh, the whole system that we interact with is a big chaotic uh, emergent thing that's a lot bigger than human scale, uh, even a lot bigger than, uh, you know, a uh, thousand or a hundred thousand or, or a couple million humans put together. It, it moves at a much bigger um, scale, uh, like almost unmanageable, well, actually unimaginably large. So, so then I think, uh, I, so then you have to look for chim tabs on how to kind of control this big uh, golem beast, uh, wonderful mess thing. Um, and then you have to have governance structures to help you uh, manipulate the trim tabs or something like that. Um, I think another reality is uh, obviously in our world, uh, there are fairly big pe people who have figured out how to have leverage in the world 
um, especially by manipulating other people. And so our our solution is complicated by the fact that we're not going to have everybody, everybody cooperating in what we want to do. There are actually going to be people, sets of people, bending trim tabs that we may or may not know about even um, in ways that are going to try to thwart um, the efforts of the people that are trying to do good. So that's another kind of challenge to um, to align with. And I think it's, you know, it's as big, the, the positive solution and the defensive solutions have to be um, as big. Uh, it's it's not like we, we can kind of worry, you know, mostly about the good stuff. Um, they're actively people fighting um, the good stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um, do you want to check in really briefly? And then I'll do a little go around. Uh, no, don't have anything to check in with. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stacy, if you'll, if you want to just check, um, I have nothing not... to check in with. I'll wait till we to get back well, to Sam's question. <laughs> well, I see a trend. Let's skip the check in and go to Dave, who's next in the queue. Uh, Jerry, I had a check in though. No. Oh, <laughs> damn it! Uh, governance is hard, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we've been doing a bunch of governance stuff. Uh, in GRC, so we've been having a weekly governance call for you know, a couple of years now, and it's interesting. I, I feel like I've kind of my thinking is has, has advanced, so and it's fun to kind of come have it in this uh, this other context. Um, a couple of things that have struck me about it about the framing, Sam, is um, I've been trying to see governance like a living system. So even the trim tab would be a mechanical um, inter, you know intervention. I feel like if you if you if you just step back and you look at um, governance it's kind of governance really is everywhere right so I, I when i was in the public policy school i would think about national government and state government and local government but really you have to add in all the utility districts and all the corp all the school districts and the uh corporate boards and you know it, it turns out it's a really complicated mesh of governance there's decisions being made all kinds of different places right uh, and so this notion that we should step back and come up with good governance is kind of, it's like, yeah, you can spend time with that, but the reality is already so complicated that you're actually going to be, you're, you're planting in a very busy field. Um, and so I thought, and I, and then like in the regeneration stuff, I think you see two different strategies. One, there's like a green fields strategy for a whole bunch of stuff like eco villages. I'm going to go to a place all by myself and I'm going to create my own new thing that I get to control, right? Which is kind of cute. And I'm gonna, or I'm gonna have a floating island somewhere, right? Of my own, or I'm gonna go to Mars, well, you know, whatever. But that I get to start fresh and do it all by myself. And for me, the more realistic perspective is I've got to exist within some current environment. And then I have to take, you know, take for granted all the, all the complications that are already there. So I feel like it's more realistic to think about how is there going to be like kind of evolutions in government or new new strategies are introduced into this system or, you know, how do you fertilize or how do you prune? I don't know what the metaphors are going to be, but, you know, kind of in an existing complicated system um, is at least more of a more applicable level of analysis than trying to, you know, imagine a, a utopian uh, uh, virgin governance setting. Thanks, Dave. Uh, has GRC compiled these things in uh, posts, uh, any place where, where there's a trail left behind of your discussion? So it sounds like you've had a lot of fruitful conversations. We do have a bunch of them uh, that have been recorded now, and they're, and they're actually on a YouTube playlist. Um, we've kind of had, you know, GRC stuff is for GRC. Um, anybody's welcome to join if you want, but um, but we haven't published them publicly. Bummer. I would love to turn uh, GPT loose on the transcripts of, of your your favorites of those calls and just see what's in there. That would be yeah. I don't. If that's easy to do. We could we could definitely do that. If you can point us on the OGM list to some of the good calls and say, hey, if you watch these five or six calls, uh, you would get it. Then we can go scoop up the transcripts and see what's up. Uh, um, okay. Let me let me think about that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Stacy. Thank you. Um, so I agree with everything I've heard. Um, what I want to say, which is what I've always believed, is that the most important part of any governance that I actually think that we the people or we here in this group could actually impact is the method by which we communicate and educate 
whatever policies are going on, whatever's happening. And um, I, I do think that the people in this group could make an impact on how those things happen. I'll, I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Um, thanks, Stacey. Uh, Sam. Uh, you're muted. Just a few things that came up um, as people were talking. It's like, you know, governance, you know, you, you don't want to, you, you know, it's too big of a mess. And also, it's needed at various scales. And I think those are really important. I think a lot of what I thought about is the human process of gov of decision making. And how do people in groups make decisions? And so that process itself should be sort of at the core of whatever governance structure is created. And yeah, so that that's that's my thought on that. Um, so sort of self improvement heading in toward um, toward some. I'm go ahead and say more. Oh no! So more like um, understanding human frailty. So like um, our inability our tendency towards you know all the cognitive biases and um you know the, the the issues that we face the loudest person in the room um you know having the most say and like there are, there are these problems that we run into continuously when we um are making decisions in groups and so designing a core decision making process that accounts for our human frailties and allows us to work in groups in such a way that the best ideas rise to the top and um using like the best math that is available to help us decide what you know in any group whether it's a board or a city or a bioregion or a watershed or a nation or a, the world you know um you know there we i believe that we can <clears throat> apply the technology that's already been developed to allow the best, you know, in, in what, at whatever scale we're, we're dealing with. And so if we come up with a system that can work, it could probably work, you know, rinse and repeat. So. Um, just to mess with metaphors, I think for some reason, when you said that, I was like, well, maybe the best ideas should leak out the sides. Um, and, and part of what I'm really interested in is contagious ideas where you see somebody who's doing something some way and then you're like, oh, I'd like to try that. And then you try it and it works really well, but you adapt it a couple of ways because it didn't really work for your situation. And then you talk about it a lot and then someone else is like, oh, that's really good. And then someone maybe codifies it, but there's danger in codifying it. Um, although there's wisdom in telling the story over and over again. So where's the boundary between those things? How do you keep things plastic enough that people feel like they own and respect and can appropriate things? yet um, concrete enough that people can even see the story and see what happened. And I, I think that boundary is really, really fascinating. Um, thanks, Sam. Uh, Doug. Okay, um, two things. The first is a story about the failure of governance uh, on large scale. And that is Biden gave a speech to the UN a couple of days ago and it was quite comprehensive about what's happening in the U.S., his history in, uh, as president. But what was really striking in the whole talk is there was never the mention of climate, which seems an incredible failure of leader leadership that we have to watch out for. Uh, Biden is seen as relatively sane, calm, balanced, and yet the repression is there. Second thought. Uh, many parts of the world are becoming unlivable uh, through heat, crop failure, forest fires, floods, whatever. The result is that the governance that we need has to deal with uh, islands of livability that are not well connected to each other except through failure zones. And I think that's a really interesting perspective. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Jose. Um, but you and I have had this conversation, Jerry, back and forth a couple of times around uh, governance. Um, I, I think it's really easy to t think of governance as government. 
and as regulation, as structures that impose, um, and not as emergent properties of human relationships. And we, we do well in small groups, in our families and then friendships and communities, reasonably well. Um, we, we tend not to create wars. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but I think that when we start thinking about how do we do things at scale, the tendency is to say, let's go from the top down, right? Because that's the kind of structure we've had historically. And so my question is, uh, it's much like what you said, Jerry, about, you know, almost like oozing from the sides. Um, how do we do this from a, um, from a ground up perspective? How do we, as individuals, have a radical sense of empowerment that we can work with others and, but stand alone and have the responsibility for standing alone together, right? Not alone independently, but alone interdependently, recognizing that it is about a, a community. And, and so talking about governance for me means how do I start with the individual and in understanding human nature, which isn't about logic or uh, values or systems of, of symbolic structures that we've created, but about be human behavior as an organic system. And, and what happens and what do people do organically? And from there, understand what guides our behavior. Because for me, ultimately, in the right conditions, people do the right things. It's when the wrong conditions emerge that they start to do the wrong things. Um, and so how do we build conditions for ourselves and, that help us maintain a uh, a quality of life that I think everybody seeks without imposing on each other. There's a saying that I think comes out of Agile or somewhere in there that is make the right thing to do the easiest thing to do. I'll, I'll find the right quote, but it's something like that. But I think I think that's in the spirit of what you're saying, right? Yeah. Um, Stuart, uh, you need to unmute. But of course. But of course. Um, so a couple of things, um, after 9-11, I was a volunteer table facilitator at a gathering of 5,000 people at the Javis Center in New York, 500 tables of 10. And, um, the question was, what shall we do with ground zero? And it was a pretty amazing experience because m most of all the attendees were people who were connected in some way to the folks that were um, injured, survived, um, et cetera. And when we left at the end of the day, and I have no idea what algorithms were used, but everybody got a, a report of the outcome of the, 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 um, <clears throat> the collated responses of all the tables. And I also remember the work of, of Peter and uh, Trudy. Trudy, in terms of, wow, what an opportunity to collect people, to connect people technologically in the world when we think about governance to really go down to the <clears throat> very, 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 uh, you know, <laughs> ground zero <laughs> of where governance actually happens or where, where it might happen. So just, you know, two thoughts. Um, the other um, two thoughts I have, one, um, you cannot legislate this kind of stuff. I mean, a, a Congress of the U.S., I'll look at it for years because it was so dominated and controlled by lawyer. 
lawyers, every time there was a wrong, they would try to create a right. Um, and now you've got all of these crazy unenforceable statutes on the book that are just an absolute waste of time. The last thing is um, when, and I will represent um, Doug B here and his thinking and my own thinking also, when Doug <clears throat> mentioned that Biden's speech did not address climate change, um, my reaction was, yeah. And, and the, reason, the reason I say, yeah, is until we have a different way of thinking and a different way of being, we ain't solving nothing. <laughs> it's just so foundation, it's just so absolutely foundational, okay? And I think that that's what Biden was, was kind of pointing to speaking at. And, and I'm, I'm, one of the things that I'm enthused about Kamala Harris's campaign is that I hear a visionary in there. I hear someone who wants to think differently about the challenges um, that we have. Thank you. Sam, please. Uh, yeah, so many tangents to take, but I wanted to sort of talk a little, Jose said a few things I, I just wanted to say, you know, there's uh, address there, uh, in the calls, there's this kind of uh, tension with the idea of democracy, idea of governance even, um, and sort of wanting to pull it back into coordination instead of calling it governance or democracy. And I, I think like there's something healthy about that, which is like, you know, how can we court, like it needs to be a coordination system. So the problem is that if you have, um, it's, it's somebody, the decision has to be made somewhere, right? And so then more narrowly it gets made, you know, you have um, a group, groups of empowered and disempowered. And the more structural that is, the more likely abuses will emerge. And also the less likely, you know, it's uh, there, I don't know if you guys have seen this, um, the, the, these five principles that I've put to, been working on put together um, uh, for, for um, good governance, but one of these principles is like the, the people who are affected by decisions must be empowered in those decision making. They must be able to contribute to coming up with solutions to the problems. They're in the problems. They're the ones who have to deal with it. So, um, so it's this concept of like, you know, um, author avoiding authoritarianism. Too much power concentrated at the top. But there's also another problem, right? Which is we just can't get it together. We can't. We can't solve the problems. We can't figure out how to stop using up every ounce of carbon in the ground. We can't figure out how to stop dumping toxic chemicals and heavy metals everywhere. We can't figure out how to stop wars and inequalities and all the, you know, CRISPR gene drive bioweapons, you know, we can't figure out how to stop these things, right? So there's a failure of coordination on one end. And then there's authoritarianism on the other. And so we're, we're looking for something that sort of isn't one of those, right? It's something that's going to, and for it not to be authoritarian, it has to emerge from the will of the people, right? It has to bubble up from the people who are actually experiencing things. But um, but I liked a lot what, I, I forget who said it was, um, but like um, this idea of making um, <laughs> the easy, the right thing to do easy. And, you know, it, it's like, at some point, it's just the UI, you know, it's like, you go to a grocery store and you know you're you're walking down the aisle and you're waiting there to pay for your stuff and there's candy and chocolate and of course people are going to buy candy and chocolate and so designing a system like the ui of the system because it's going to have to be a computer based system for us to be able to manage this number of people um so designing it in such a way that um makes the right thing to do easy in other words it 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 it, it um it's intuitive and it and it it facilitates coordination that to me is the is the thing that needs to happen and it's kind of silly to say like well we need to solve our um world problems with a better ui but that's kind of how i see it yeah so this is a ui design problem i'm i'm glad it's simple i mean i'm just kidding uh oh and you're still you're muted you're answering your phone okay um kevin uh 
Unmute, please, Kevin. Laptop, sorry. Yeah, I, following up on what Stuart said uh, about the dysfunction of the left being overcome, essentially, <clears throat> you know, uh, Biden was a great politician without charisma, but um, the dysfunction of the left, you know, it can be shown in, in uh, the right to life versus freedom of choice where uh, right to life were able to make single issue partnerships with people with whom they disagreed on other issues. So the Christian right has always done that. Whereas on the left, uh, Barbasi's book linked looks at this on uh, freedom of choice groups needed a litmus test. And so they only grew uh, their network uh, arithmetically, whereas the other do geometrically. What I see in Harris that I like is she can do single issue partnerships. She'll back off on fracking, but then be for other things. And we need a pragmatist who can do single issue partnerships with people with whom she disagrees <clears throat> and, and piss off the left, which is they should be most a lot of the time. I mean, Gaza is this whole other issue. But, uh, you know, that that's somebody who can govern. And but she also has charisma and enthusiasm. You know, it's, it's like, you know, um, She's she's Joe Biden with a beating heart, you know, and I, I think it's 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 I'm excited about it. So, um, Kevin, I like your comments. And Sam is asking us in the chat to keep away from current events and to try to sort of imagine some futures, which I think is good advice. Imagine this is the utopia I'm describing. There we go. Uh, reframing so quick. Just that. That was good, Kevin. Um, <laughs> so. Something you said, Sam, um, I think one of the questions when we talk about governance as an emergent property and not as a, a something that happens to others, but as something that we do together, um, which is a very different way of thinking about governance, right? Because our system is so stuck in this idea that we need someone to make decisions for us or some people to make decisions that we get stuck in the idea that we need as many decisions as we make. We, I think, don't actually need as many decisions as we think we need. My, my gut tells me that many of the decisions that we make at a political level today emerge because the decisions aren't allowed to be made at a lower level. So, you know, I'm in the streets. I walk by someone who's um, homeless. I want to help. I try to give them money. I try to give them food, so on and so forth. And, and then I just sort of give up because I don't know what else to do. And I look at my wife and I go, well, hopefully the city will do something about this. Hopefully a nonprofit will do something about this. Hopefully the county, hopefully the state, right? And it's, and it's like, I, I don't know what to do because I'm, I'm not empowered to do anything. I don't have the ability to make the decision that I could make if, if it wasn't that there is a whole bunch of rules that prevent citizens from engaging in things because that's not our thing, right? It's their privacy, it's this, this, it's that, that, and, and it just sort of disempowers us. And it's not so much disempowered because we're prevented from doing it. It disempowers us because somebody else is supposed to be doing it, right? Somebody else has the responsibility or the, or, or the mandate for, for that work. And so for me, most of the decisions that we think we need to make are decisions that we've created rather than decisions that actually need to be made at a, at a higher level. That the local level decision-making would make those decisions not necessary. And I don't know if, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, certainly I'd like to understand better what you think. Thanks for what you said. Um, you reminded me of a little story though, uh, which is our niece, uh, when she was seven or something like that, made the local news in Denver because she saw homeless people on the street and said, hey, hey, parents, what's up with this? Mm -hmm. And she started making bags of supplies of food to give to them. And she would, whenever they went out, they would have some bags and they would actually hand out food. 
and and the, the scale of response is not commensurate to the scale of the problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But very yeah. often there are things we we could do, except we're inured to the problem because it's so big. We don't feel like getting involved because it might be dangerous. We there's I, you could come up with six different reasons why it doesn't make a lot of sense to get involved. Well, just to answer that, um, we walked around here for almost a year with a small backpack. Every time we went for a walk, we carried a small backpack. With I, I work with a food bank that does some homeless. Uh, and so I learned about hygiene kits and I learned about food kits and cold kits, cold weather kits. And so we carried those things depending on what was going on. I'd say 80% of the time people would say no. So that's part of what happens. We've built a system where people are somehow um, resisting that that local help. Thank you. So that, so that really that puts a lot of texture on the question. Uh, Stuart. Yeah, uh, a few things. Uh, earlier, Jose in the call, Jose said that you know we don't do that bad ourselves in um, in in governing. Um, we don't create wars, etc. And, and I just wanted to say, go to family court on any day, and you'll see how well we are doing. Okay, um, so that's one. Um, two, and Sam, I appreciate your pointing in this direction. Okay. And I think I said this on a call last week. We need new languaging for everything we're talking about here, because the languaging of it um, is very, very much outcome determinative. <clears throat> now, um, the real question or concern is, um, will everything have to fall apart um, before we can create something with new languaging that is workable. Um, um, lately, I'm leaning towards that as my own operative thesis for navigating the world. Um, you know, personal example over the past few weeks is, you know, and I, navigating the healthcare system. <laughs> it really is comical in certain ways. And why is it? Because we have dropped in the profit motive and everything's got algorithms and the docs, they really can't do healthcare. And I, and I understand that, you know, I frankly, personally, am just not going to tolerate it. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's my perspective. I imagine the challenges that folks without um, resources, and I'm talking about capacity to understand and navigate the system that they're in. I, I would imagine it's just mind blowing in terms of um, a level of frustration that I can't even imagine because they can't, they don't have the ability to navigate. You know, where that is on the scale, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Um, but that's a classic example of how we've created something that's too big and too big to fail because <laughs> it's got to perpetuate itself because at least it's it's more than nothing. Um, anyway, it, that's a that's a, a longer story for another day and I hope to report back with um, some some uh, some victories of, of how one can can do that. Thanks, Stuart. One of the fascinating aspects of institutions and humans is how durable the institutions are because humans are unwilling to leave them, even when they're crappy. And like female genital mutilation in West Africa is a, an example, and there's a resurgence of it. There's a bunch of lawsuits happening and a bunch of backlash against progress that was made by Molly Melching and a bunch of other people against a practice that I just have to say seems extremely barbaric. But if you're if you're uncircumcised within certain cultures, you're unmarriageable, and changing that has been maybe the hardest piece of all of it. 
Um, so so how, do, how do we step through, how do we change our language? How do we transcend current models? How do we um, step into worlds that seem impossible? I think that's a that's the challenge of our time because we're 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 marinating in systems that are not that humane. Yeah, it takes courage. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of interpersonal courage to engage and having and have those conversations. Uh, Stacy. Well, thank you for permission to imagine. Um, going back to some of the things I've heard, imagine if we were able to have engaging conversations use, utilizing the local public broadcasting systems as a first step. Then technology could come in and do whatever it needed to do to build on that. But just imagine those kinds of conversations where all of the things that, you, that I've heard in this call took place on a local level, not controlled by the same things that normally control things and done in an engaging way. That, that's all I have to say. That, that's my imagining. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. And there, there are a few cases of civic discourse being recorded and broadcast on uh, public media, et cetera, et cetera. There's a few of those stories. Not, they're not plentiful. And I don't and I don't know that public media, radio and TV, has gone far enough into that or done it often enough or made itself a home for that. It's like, ah, we can't support that as a program somehow. And wouldn't it be cool if there were some stations you could watch where there's high functioning communities that are just sharing what you, what they do? other than public access channels, which are usually, I think, only local and hard to find, you know, uh, broadly, but interesting. Um, Sam. So many, so many um, tangents here, but um, let me see. I think one of the things that I just, because it's just on the top of my mind, the one that Stacey mentioned was this idea of local conversations the problem with local conversations, I mean, firstly, we need to be able to coordinate at the scale uh, where we affect things, right? So, um, you know, if there's a group of people who wants to, you know, dump toxic waste into the water and it's flowing everywhere, you know, we need to be able to coordinate at that level, you know, and frankly, that includes the world. There's There's a need for coordination at the level of the world at this point with the power that we have but that but there's also a need to coordinate in a family and there's a need to coordinate in a city and there's a need to and so um and so something somebody said i forget even who but um the idea maybe jose the idea of where's the ideal place for the coordination of this particular issue right so with the homeless person is it at the level of your family and making bags is that the place to coordinate to solve the problem of homelessness or or hunger, or is it at the city, or is it like where? Where is it? And maybe one of the benefit, one of the, or maybe it's at several of those levels. And um, you know, I think one of the, I one of the properties of a system, a good coordination system, would be to be able to kind of identify where, um, you know, where where the coordination needs to happen. So, and we we know that it's going to happen at very various scales. So. Um, the other thing I liked what Stacy said about local conversations. The problem I have is that people are talking. You know, you talk to two. You have two people. Two people talk, and they'll tell you what they think. Right? They tell you how they feel, um, but you don't get a sense for how a population thinks or feels from that. And so, um, and so, and there are people who are just too shy to talk. You know, and so. Um, but what could happen? And I'm an advocate of liquid democracy. So just putting that out there. The idea is that, um, you know, people can, you know, engage to the degree that they want to, they can delegate to anybody. And so they could delegate to their uncle, or they could delegate to somebody who's, you know, an expert in a particular field uh, around this particular topic, an expert on homelessness, or whatever it happens to be. And this idea that when enough people, when when this, a group, a system, a city, uh, uh, um, you know, um, or even a family, a large family, um, identifies that there are a, a small number of people who really encapsulate well the positions, the different 
positions. So some people think we should keep grandma at home. And some people think we should put her in a, in an old folks home. Um, like, um, and the, the, the whole extended family has sort of identified that there are people who rep, who, who uh, embody these positions well, then it's time for a, a local debate between these two people. And so the system identifying people that embody positions and putting, you know, creating a YouTube post, uh, hosted or, you know, whatever, um, debate uh, live, you know, with, with certain par parameters and stuff where people can tune into it and they can change their vote on the topic or re-delegate. You could say, oh, no, you know what? She's, he's got a good point. This, you know, assisted living is really, really cool. And, you know, the grandmas are, you know, all playing ping pong together and, you know, or whatever, whatever the, the scenario is. But I think this person is actually closer to what's useful. And so this idea of, um, of, have, of, selecting those local selecting the participants of the local conversations based on the trust that they have earned like a trust network so um there were some other things i wanted to talk about navigating healthcare systems like it's so important and, and like so this example of grandma is an example of that if a group of people were trying to make a decision on how to navigate and they could do it in such a way that they didn't the loudest person in the room the domineering you know, patriarch or the matriarch or whatever it is, is just deciding what to do. No, there's a way for people to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is what this this is an option. This is an option. And everyone's saying, oh, that is an option. I like that one. You know what? I don't want to think about this, but I like the way you're talking about it. And so I'm going to delegate to you and whatever you anytime you vote, you get two votes and I'm out. You know, this is a close approximation to what I think about this close enough because I really don't care that much. But I think he's on the right track. She's on the right track, whatever. So that, um, you know, at the at the small scale, same thing at the large scale. How should we handle, you know, uh, uh, CRISPR gene drive, you know, bioweapon manufacturing? Well, I like the way this person talks about it. Anything that has to do with bioweapons, their vote is going to count for two because they're getting mine. And I, you know, it's beyond me. So, um, and that's a way of approximating, of having the ideas bubble up from the will of the people uh, along trust lines of trust, a, a, a lines of ethical and value alignment. Um, so I think that that's um, that's about the scale. That's about also about expertise. You know, filtering conversations. Like if if the the nation is having a conversation about bioweapons and it's a big unruly mess, I want to go. Hey, I just only want to hear what you know bioethicists have to say. I don't really care about what anybody else has to say. What is a bioethicist? Click bioethicist. Okay. Oh, here's all the bioethicists. Here's what they've said. Um, this person said, you know, we're we're going to, you know, run into all kinds of bioethical issues because we're going to be able to clone humans. In fact, we already can. And actually we already have. So and what's going to happen? Are all the wealthy people going to be able to clone each other? That's a really good idea. They can clone each other themselves as many times as they want. We can have how, a billion... how else are you going to get spare parts? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I can clone them and hang them and keep them on uh, propofol all day long. No, but as, as disgusting as that sounds. But um, so, um, yeah, but that, that's the point. Like, there are ethical issues and I, I you know, and, and that I might want to, I might want to delegate to somebody, you know, that might be the line of trust that I would have with regard to, um, you know, uh, synthetic biology. And so for to have a system where people can identify experts and identify people who or are aligned with their values and both ethically and expertise wise. So yeah, that's, that's what I have to say. That was a lot of good stuff, Sam. Thank you. Um, I wanted to slip three things into the stream quickly. One was something I put in the chat a moment ago, which was a TEDx talk by Elizabeth Markle, which I really, really liked. And she's, and she says, look, when you go to the doctor, they give you, they usually tell you four things like, Hey, lose weight, uh, eat better, get some exercise and get rid, get rid of your stress and, and maybe find a social group. And, none of those things is there an Rx for, right? None of those. And and basically it's like, good luck to you with these things because we're not going to actually help you with most of these. They don't have any training in any of them. So anyway. Uh, well, they're starting to like KP, Kaiser uh, actually sends stuff and says, hey, we have free stress reduction <laughs> programs, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> which Stuart is causing Stuart to laugh. But, the, but, but they're aware at least. Officers now. full of shit. <laughs> Period. Okay. End of story. Their right. marketing is great, but they are full of shit. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that the thing Elizabeth is pointing to is, hey, 
why don't we make it super easy in any community for there to be places where you could walk in and together with other people do a little bit of all these sorts of things, uh, which is a, a lovely thing that we're completely missing. Uh, then two, the two other things are, we, I think we wind up giving up and thinking that democracy is this time, we vote once every four years and now nail biter elections uh, versus democracy is an ongoing process where you can proxy your vote to other people as you were just describing Sam over time. And you know, David Reed is a, a geek friend of mine who I would trust implicitly with any, any regulations or any votes or any issues around electromagnetic spectrum, communication, all that kind of stuff. If he wanted to, I would happily proxy my vote over to him within that scope of operation and then just listen to what he's doing over time, but ignore that issue for a long time. I wouldn't then have to pay attention to everything. I could then find people whose opinions I really value on different issues and allow them to represent me. And, and David could go to Congress and say, I have the backing of 1,236,334, oops, five um, people on this issue, as opposed to AARP saying we represent seniors and not really actually re representing anybody because they're not actually in conversation with anybody, right? There's so there's so much potential here for the things that that you're describing. Um, sorry to take so much time, Dave. Uh, yeah, I was. Well, I mean, one thing I was I was kind of I think I'm reacting to something that uh, Stuart you said earlier. Uh, around the you know the, the impending collapse and, and you you helped me understand it in some sense because I, I've been very kind of troubled by the notion that we have to have an, a collapse and I realized that in the way you said it it's like oh the, the collapse gives you that greenfield opportunity if we after the collapse then we'll be able to fix everything because we'll have gotten rid of all this other stuff right and so that's kind of I, I think a lot of the logic of the poly crisis and stuff there's this essential collapse and we're trying to work live beyond the collapse, right? And it's like, oh, because that gets that gets rid of all the mess, you know. And it's like, well, okay, let's deal with the mess in the meantime. It's been my my thought, and you know, not not assume the collapse is coming. It may still, but let's not, you know, that's not the working assumption. Um, but but it did help me. I mean, I really feel like that's the issue. Is it's the greenfield versus brownfield strategy for change, you know? Um, and and I and I and I feel like, and I think maybe this was more reaction to some of the things Jose was saying that that there that you know, trying to help the homeless person. I think a lot of my thinking through my life has been this technocratic, I'm going to do good for other people thing. And I think that might be a problem. I mean, that might be wrong. It may, it may be that we should, you know, kind of be more Buddhist and like help your, they should focus on yourself first and then try to be, you know, joyful and giving in the community. But it's, you know, like the idea that I'm going to go fix somebody else, I actually think may be a big driver of the MAGA movement, you know, the, Public, American public health provoked a huge chunk of um, U.S. society it, with fully good intentions, I think, right, to try to help American society, but provoked them into this kind of irrational craziness because they were being told what to do. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, somehow or another, we need, a, I think, a better strategy to, you know, uh, it, instead of fixing other people's problems, I think Carol Sanford talks about becoming a resource to them so that they can solve problems or or something. It, it just kind of, I don't know how we change our role exactly, but, but you know, like where I wanted to go fix the problems and I'll define the solution and then I'll go implement it. I think we should be suspicious of that strategy. Uh, Dave, if you can, uh, over time, point to where Carol talks about that particular issue, because I don't remember that. I don't associate that with her, and I'd love to learn more about it. That'd be great. Yeah, that's in that No More Gold Stars book that I was um, ah, gotcha. raving about, so I'll put a link in here. Thanks. Um, I, awesome. uh, I agree with that, David. Uh, it, it's not about trying to fix other people's problems, but it is about being in community and helping each other. And uh, and 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 I think that human urge to want to help um, is life trying to serve life, right? It's, it's, it's built into us. It's hard to look away, right? But now we're kind of blinded by all of the dysfunction around us, I think. Uh, Stuart, you, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, the fact that maybe we don't know how to deal with each other because family court's full of people who are dysfunctional. My parents were quite dysfunctional. Um, my dad was an alcoholic. My mom was um, just crazy. Um, she's still alive, but she's a she's a crazy lady. Um, and I, 
And I didn't understand this when I was a kid because I thought, you know, I've got like the worst family ever, right? My parents are crazy. Um, my dad has had PTSD. He was um, in the Angolan War um, with that the Portuguese were fighting um, with with the locals and came back and just, just had all kinds of PTSD. We didn't know what it was called then. Uh, subsequently, I, I understood that. My mom was basically abandoned at the age of 12 after her dad died and her mother remarried and uh, and uh, sh her new husband didn't care for her. So she was uh, put out to uh, be a live-in nanny for someone else. Um, we create these situations. We create these dysfunctions. Um, I don't know of anybody who has a dysfunctional family that doesn't have a reason for, to be dysfunctional. Um, so how do we co-regulate with one another in a way that doesn't create dysfunction so that we don't have to regulate the dysfunction? <laughs> because that's the problem, right? Like we, we're always trying to fix the problem rather than not create the problem in the first place, right? And, and that's what I mean by emergent. Emergent isn't about solving problems that have already happened. Emergent is about ma making it so that those problems don't arise, right? Um, and maybe that's not true, Sam, love to hear more. But um, before I drop off, and unfortunately I, I do have to drop off, I've got another call at nine. Um, I, I had wanted to mention a project that we're working on, um, which is our protocols. And our protocols is um, the idea that we can build protocols together. They're open source protocols that we adopt as individuals. They don't force anybody to use them. They're just good solutions to problems. How do I do X? And people can create new versions of those solutions. So there can be a hundred different versions of the same thing for the same need. And um, that open source idea is, what if we actually stop thinking about rules that regulate and think about protocols that support our ability to do the right thing in the right way. And, and we do so not in a way where we're kind of forcing each other to abide by this thing, but that we choose to adopt that protocol for ourselves. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys think, but unfortunately I do have to drop off. Um, Shoot. So. I'm sorry to lose you the conversation, Jose. Yeah, no, thank you for, for doing it. And uh, thank you, Sam, for bringing it up. I think this has been very fruitful. I was, I was smiling in the middle of what you were saying because I was thinking of what a challenge you're setting for Ken to find an appropriate poem for us at the end. I'm like, ah, Jesus. <clears throat> anyway. Yeah, I, I trust that he will do uh, he a always job does. as he always does. He so, always does. Uh, Somehow like the dart lands in the right place all the time. It's crazy. He's, uh, yeah, he, he's got a special touch. And then to the very last thing you said, uh, there's a thought in my brain I'm just putting, adding to the chat. We pass laws and impose rules when discourse fails. I think that's very much in the spirit of what you're saying. And I that's exactly it. one of the things I really hate about Donald Trump to go to the present for just one moment is the way he shatters norms, because I think we should be mostly norms and not a lot of laws and rules. And he his his one of his key strategies is shredding norms uh, and it makes him really appealing to people, et cetera, et cetera. But but I want a world in which mostly we don't need money and we don't need laws. Human nature, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump off, but human nature is to want to fit in. In other words, be part of the norms um, and to fight the law, the rules. Yep. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. I hadn't, I hadn't quite thought of those two things together. So thank you. For anyway, that. Thank you all. Thanks, Jose. Uh, Stuart, the floor is yours. Just to pick up very quickly on this last point about Trump, people don't think of him this way, um, and the press has certainly legit legitimized him. But he's a he's an a, he's an anarchist. 
He, he is an anarchist, period, end of story. Um, he wants to operate in a place where there are no rules and there are no controls on him. One. Two, uh, pardon my outburst earlier, it's the uh, pugnacious Brooklyn-born Jewish lawyer that lives inside of me. And you are also living this experience as we speak, <laughs> and we are all concerned for your health. And so you had very nice reason to blurt what you blurted, <laughs> even though it was a blurt, but <laughs> blurt you so, did. So I, I was going to say something else, but I forgot it. So I'll, I'll say what's what's current in, in terms of mind, because it ties in with the notion of... Um, and I can't remember who raised it, but the expectation that government is going to take care of stuff um, because it's parallel to the idea that um, Kaiser is going to take care of my health care. And the realization that, you know, you have to be a very, very, very much an advocate um, in, the, in the context of creating what it is you want the institution to do. Um, it's just so absolutely critical. And unless you can find partners within the institution who are going to operate at the same level of, uh, that you're trying to operate on, you're just banging your head against the wall. I mean, the specific, the specific example was, you know, being given a drug where the solution was much worse <laughs> than the problem because people fail to take care of you as an individual as opposed to the number um, that you are, you know, patient 11907561. Um, uh, and I'm going to try and use that positively and beneficially. Um, and it's not that I come without portfolio. I've coached senior executives at Kaiser. I've designed communication programs. I've led retreats. Um, I understand some of the algorithms that they're under. But um, uh, uh, I want to try and use that to see if I can turn the docs into something that's more of a real healthcare provider. And they're both um, fairly young. Um, but I think that's what we all need to be is mindful contributors, consumers of governance. Because, you know, governance can do stuff for us that we can't do individually for ourselves. You know, we can't create a fire department. Or maybe we can. Or a police department. Or the kinds of things that are governmental functions um, that are workable. We can't create um, insurance to, you know, to help spread a risk um, that we all face. What's interesting is that a lot of the things you named started out as mutual aid societies. And then there was like the great demutualization of insurance companies, for example. But originally they were pooled risk entities, which made a ton of sense and gave them certain sets of responsibilities. And then they yeah. were. And then they became money makers. Yep. <laughs> uh, because that's the, that's the context that we, created as a um, um, as a highest social value. <clears throat> Sam, pull us out of this dive. Uh, well, okay. So, I mean, these are all, we're talking about a lot of things that are sort of orbiting this, this, this idea of how can we coordinate, you know? And, um, you know, and of course I'm like, let's, 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 let's like, come up with the thing, you know, which is like, yeah, maybe I'm putting the cart before the horse, but, um, but, uh, it, but I think if, you know, if we sort of keep, keep moving in that direction, more interesting things will emerge. I, I want to, I just want to encourage that. So, um, and I think a lot of what people are saying is that we don't like authoritarianism. If I can just boil down what, you know, and, and like inhuman um, um, hierarchies and stuff. You know, like, um, you know, and so and so that like, yes, I, I of course, that's absolutely true. So we need to coordinate, you need to find good protocols and stuff, but they can't be mired by, you know, uh, vested interests and inhuman 
sort of like um, power structures and, you know, author authoritarian structures and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, so for me, um, you know, we, the system has to look like <laughs> something where everybody gets some kind of a, a say, everybody gets some kind of a, of a vote, you know, um, and people don't like voting. They, they don't like the idea of voting, but I think it's because we use really bad voting systems. The single choice voting system that we use, where you have a list of options, you choose one, mathematically, it's garbage. Talk to any mathematician. And so we just don't have these, and I can list the, you know, the spoiler effect and the lesser two evils and all of the problems that we're facing. You could almost attribute all of them directly to the single choice voting method system that the founding fathers chose because they didn't know the math. They didn't have it. It wasn't that well evolved at the time and they just didn't have the right papers in front of them. So, um, so that's a big part of it. But I think, you know, if we, if we already consider that, like, you know, I'm going to sort of just propose this because it's, you know, it's, we're, we're kind of like getting to the point here where I would like us to have something to chew on um, something like, we're, we're, we're um, 70 minutes into the call and we haven't solved the problem yet. So yeah, get to it. So, um, so my proposal is that is 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 that sort of UI, <laughs> like as ridiculous as that sounds. Um, like, but basically this sort of liquid democracy, and I, I've heard on the calls people saying that they had better ideas than liquid democracy. I would love to talk with somebody who feels that like I would love to hear it because you know I'm building something and um you know, if you got a better idea, I'll just stop right now. I, I don't need I'm not attached to this, but I want to <laughs> like I feel an urgent need to, you know, solve the problem. I mean, right now we have a representation system where, you know, you have a person who's representing a, a, bill, a million people in California. How I, you, you can't, I can't represent this group adequately. And we're all, you know, white folks, you know I mean? Like, come on. And, um, and so more or less. So the, um, the idea of representation is absolutely broken, but what, but we can't there's the problem of um you know of um we can't cut nobody can fit all of the problems that a complex society faces into their head like they, they don't have enough room for the expertise or the time to consider it and so we need some way of delegating but delegating is different than representing you know i, I don't think you can trust anybody to represent you but if i can delegate to you um based on like you said based on your expertise um that I can I I trust that you're going to make decisions that are are in alignment with me because I've seen how you act and I I know that you know what you know and there has been there have been studies that shown that people delegate to people of um, who are more knowledgeable and experienced than they are on topics that's actually been shown in studies so so this way of concentrating expertise onto the challenges that a group faces I think is is ideal and so you've got. Um, whether it's a family or whether it's a, the world, you have a system, you need a system where the delegation, the, the, the concentration of power happens, can happen um, instantly and be revoked instantly. So as soon as I delegate to you, I can see how you're voting. I can see what your comments are and what your, you know, your proposals are and all that stuff. And I go, whoa, wait a minute, this isn't the right person. Sorry, <laughs> got it wrong. And just instantly switch. And so this ability to, um, uh, you know, find alignment, like to, and, and uh, all of the, there's so many ways that people can find alignment. And I think a lot of the systems that people propose, like with AI, for example, so which I, which AI is it going to be? Is it going to be an, an all powerful godlike AI that we just, del we just abdicate to? Like that sounds like a recipe for disaster, but what if each person had their own personal AI that could search the system, search the UI, search the 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 list of proposals on the local scale, on the city, on the nation, on the in the world, in the bioregion, in the watershed, and um and like vote for you maybe or bring things that um you might be of interest in, might be interested in to um to your attention or find people that are in alignment with you like an AI could do a lot of things without us having to abdicate to it, right? So when people could decide for themselves where they um, 
could people could uh, decide for themselves how much they want to delegate, how much they how much how much do they want to use their personal assistant to do, you know, um, that kind of thing. So, but at the foundation of all of those systems, um, including you know trust networks, all of those things, at the foundation needs to be, hey, I get a say, like I need to have a vote in this thing, right? Like I'm I'm a person and I'm going to be affected by the decisions, and you know. Um, so whether I delegate or not should be my choice. And if I choose to do something stupid with my vote, I get that choice. We have to trust the wisdom of the crowd and the and this idea of that we're going to empower people who are smarter than us on average um, to account for those things. So uh, so that's my little rant about why I think liquid democracy solves the problem of, you know, both um being non-authoritarian it's it's a it's at its foundation it's a direct democracy and um and but but it allows for us to delegate along lines of expertise or whatever we want so we can just sort of um cognitive load reduce our cognitive load but still have there be an approximation of our perspectives you know a, and a pretty decent one if we take a few seconds to do it um and so that that model applied locally applied regionally applied um globally I, I think is the answer you know and and we can talk about the details but i think you know for the problem of uh, of those those five principles of, of 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 good governance um you know where we're talking about like um let's see here uh, you know it's inclusive um where it's yeah, it, it engages diversity and tension so it, there's a place for conversation like we talked about, um, and where the best ideas can rise. So if you're impacted, you're going to be empowered. So yeah, um, integrating expertise with values. We've talked about that. Um, and um, iterative enhancement and stewardship. So the ability to actually change the system, you know, but have it be done in a way that's reasonable and not whiplashing around. You know, when you have a large body of people, there's some stability, especially the more diverse the group is. There's a saying, sorry, I'm ranting. But the, um, you know, the, the mark of a good governance system is the more diverse opinions it can hold without cr cracking. You know, in, in uh, North Korea, there's only one opinion that that society can hold, Kim Jong-il or whoever it is. But, you know, in America, we deal with a lot of different opinions. But the advantage of that is if the system can hold all of those opinions, is that we have these counterbalances. We have a broad perspective and crazy ideas on one side are, are going to be opposed by the other side. And, you know, um, so democratizing and um, using that as a safeguard to protect, you know, um, from wacky ideas and and, ch and dangerous changes. I, I, I think this is a system that could do that. Is that, I, I think that's all I want to say right now. <clears throat> that, that was another brainful. Um, thank you. Uh, Sam, have you met David Bauville? He's an infrequent OGM a participant, mostly on the free jury's brain calls on Mondays, but we haven't seen him for a little bit, lives in Berlin, and was involved in the early creation of liquid democracy, um, which might, and has, he's like, rolls his eyes when you when you sort of talk to him about this stuff, because like, yeah, we've been there, done that like decades ago, and it's still not happening. Um, but thank you for that. And I've got other questions, but I will go to Dave. Yeah, I, I got to say, Sam, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, you've got a solution in search of a problem, kind of. Um, and I'm very skeptical of the idea that there's like one size fits all to governance. I think it's going to be incredibly context dependent. And so I probably need an agile approach or something like that. Um, and in this living systems model, I've kind of ended up thinking that, I mean, the governance is all kind of nudge against each other. You know, the corporate government but nudges up against the city government, which nudges up against the state government. And the Supreme Court argues with the legislature. And they're all just bumping into each other in different kinds of ways, right? And so if, if you look at the system that way, whatever you do is going to bump into these other systems as well. And, and so I suspect that, you know, like the North Korean government is bumping into the world government in ways that are actually sometimes constructive. You know, we probably need that weed in the in the in the field. Um, and maybe it's you know it's like it's it's a, a it's a sometimes useful plant or something in the living system. So I don't know, but um, 
But anyway, so I feel like the, and, the, and the context depends very so hugely and how we make decisions and how we collaborate. It's so different in different contexts that, you know, it's like the liquid democracy might be a useful tool in the toolbox, but I can't imagine really that it's like, you know, it's the dominant paradigm or anything like that. And 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 it does seem like what I, I put a link to a Clay Shirky talk that I ran into last night. It's like a 12 year old talk. And it's like, where the hell is Clay Shirky these days when you really need him? But uh he, he's talking about how the internet's going to change governance, right? And he basically is talking about how we need Git to like be able to manage a bunch of government decision making kinds of things. Um, and and one of his points is that you know, like in terms of liquid democracy, been there, done that, is that he was saying like you know we the 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 printing press was such a big deal, you know, and it like within 150 years we had scientific journals, you know, but it, you know it took 150 years to get to scientific. He said it took 10 years to get to porn, right? Um, but 150 to get to scientific journals. And uh, I liquid democracy may, you know, may just take another couple of decades to get there, is kind of my thought. Uh, but I do think that the technology in affects the governance choices, right? So we do have different choices today than they had, you know, when the founders wrote the constitution or whatever. Um and, you know, and if you got if you got self-driving cars, you probably don't need the same kind of highway legislation, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that change as the technology evolves. So, you know, I, I think we need to kind of in, integrate some of it. And I don't know what AI is going to be able to do for us, but, you know, probably things that we hadn't, you know, we don't need the old stuff. We can use the new stuff and we, we should probably be willing to adopt that. Um, and then the one last thing is like my hobby horse around governance is that I think we need to have a... Uh, bioregional vision we we that, that there needs to be a governance layer that represents the bioregion and and that that could well be an emergent thing that just the acknowledgement that this um that we are we are governing a bioregion will make a huge contribution because right now we don't really have a mindset like that so you, you can look at the bot you can look at the bay area's reaction to uh covid and you can see that like nine of the counties kind of joined together and coordinated their activities. And they kind of represented, you know, like a region, but with all this cross-governmental, you know, cooperation going on that they had to hack together. Um, but we need a similar image to that for kind of the, the, the living systems kind of notion of the globe that's going to cross national boundaries. It's going to cross all the different kinds of boundaries. And so this web of governances start to need to know, like be aware that they are in connection with the other uh, parts of governance in a, in a geographic region um, to, to represent the living system that they're, they are in part of the governing of. Uh, so like bioregions. Um, it's too bad this topic has no juice in this crowd. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm thrilled with the conversation we're having. I want to have more of this. Uh, so let's figure out how to do it. Let's figure out how to leave more lasting artifacts. There are, we've mentioned many communities that are busy doing a lot of this work, uh, lots and lots of them. And it would be nice to synthesize and, and share without homogenizing and, you know, hierarchifying. Uh, so it would be really nice to figure out what the what the right methods for conversing and educating, as Stacy said earlier, around these things are. And I think I think we're using some of those, but not a lot of them. Uh, Pete, please. Uh, thanks, <clears throat> um, Sam. I like your uh, I like your liquid democracy uh, pitch. Um, I also really appreciate Dave's. <laughs> Like, I don't know, dude, that sounds like too much of a single solution. But anyway, I, and and Agile, uh, Dave said it needs something more Agile. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a sec. Um, uh, Sam, I really like your pitch. Uh, uh, how would we uh, how would we start implementing that? Uh, would you build a small liquid democracy system and then use it in a small place? Uh, would you convince a city uh, with a progressive mayor and city council that, hey, let's switch the whole thing over? Um, would you, you know, get uh, some uh, some uh, professional organization that's got ten thousand members to switch over, something like that? So how how do we do the next step? Um, 
I, I also, uh, I taught Agile Scrum for a while. And uh, one of the things I really like is uh, Henrik Nyberg is a really brilliant uh, Agile coach. And he has this uh, classic diagram of uh, instead of MVP, we want to do earliest testable, usable, lovable. Um, so I'm going to throw that in there. Uh, it's a great post. It makes a lot of sense. I don't know exactly how that matches with liquid democracy and rolling it out in the first steps, but whatever. Um, and then uh, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that uh, the way I listen most, most effectively is um, by uh, productively, productively doodling uh, at the same time. Um, so literally in high school, I used to sit right in front of the teacher and he or she would be watching me doodling furiously because, and, and they knew that I was getting A pluses and it's like, okay, whatever Pete needs to do to cope to listen. So um, I've been productively uh, listening by creating, by taking Sam's five principles, blowing it out to 15 and making a pattern language wiki out of it. So there you go. Um, uh, I haven't actually even really looked at it, so it'll be interesting to kind of look at it and see what it is. Uh, I, I don't mean it to be a definitive thing. I mean for it to be a, a short demo kind of, of a way to put together a set of principles like this. Um, and there you go. Thanks. Uh, I believe at this moment you can take a bow, Pete. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> I just I want to apologize for my weird facial expressions. My son is right here, ah. and he's getting up on all fours for the first time, and he's like really excited about it. And I'm like trying to oh, encourage him awesome. while staying on the call. He's like, oh. getting, you know. <laughs> you're welcome to bring us to him or do whatever you want to be like present for him because I hate to think that a Zoom is taking precedent over this this moment for you. So, um, please. Uh, don't let us interrupt. Uh, no, these 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 moments happen all the time. That's part of the benefits of having kids. Um, so there'll be there'll be an endless parade of firsts. So no problem. Excellent. And here wow. we thought you were all excited about what Pete was saying. Oh. Actually, I'm totally excited about what Pete was saying. <laughs> I was like super excited about it. Um, that's why I'm staying on the call, and I and I and I wanted to respond to what he said. I don't know if this is the appropriate time, or if we should let Jose jump in first. Um, however, you want to do it. Go ahead, sir. Oh my gosh, I was so excited! I forgot you were saying how are we going to roll it out. So he, let me just uh, sorry, Jose, to jump in, but here's here's my evil plan. Um, so the idea is to create a system that is um, that um, tracks with human group decision-making processes. So to just be as thoughtful and careful about how people sense make. So the, converse, the conversations, how the conversations need to happen, where they need to happen. Um, and and, um, and the, the process of like um, proposing, but the proposal has to be in a container where people can also make alternate proposals and, and, and state sort of the problems they're trying to solve. And like, so creating a a system that is universally applicable to group decision making and having that be the first thing and then trying to, as you said trying to roll that out to organizations housing associations corporations um you know seed suites and um and and like the idea here is that if and families and anybody else making it really accessible and so then the idea is like say the city of amsterdam i live in amsterdam and what if like you know um 30 or 40 percent of the people this was so useful and helpful that 30% of the people in Amsterdam started to use it to coordinate. They started to say, oh, well, we should do this and we should do that. And things, sensible things were being discussed. And so eventually, um, you know, uh, you know, the municipality gets involved and is engaging with it and whatever. And then the people on the platform say, well, why don't we just vote for somebody who is going to do the will of the people? And so, um, and so if they vote in candidate X or whatever, who, X might be the wrong letter, but for some people, but, but <laughs> in the candidate. Somehow who, X who, got spoiled a bit. I don't know. <laughs> I don't I, I still like X, but whatever. Um, too much algebra. I liked algebra, so whatever. Um, so, but um, the um, voted in somebody who was going to do what the people said. You know, obviously they would have their own um, ethics to deal with, but, um, and then at that moment, 
this system will have taken over the city of Amsterdam. And so it would become sort of like self, um, it would start to, to snowball where people would be able to engage in it, especially if it was accessible and easy and, you know, dealt with languages and dealt with all the other problems. Um, and if that worked well and good outcomes were coming, you know, eventually people hear about it and it could sort of roll out into a larger way where there would be sort of like a, 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 a an intermediate step where people were, um, um, were um, initiating, not initiating, but people were enacting the will of the people, you know, and um, eventually they would set up systems where the governance itself was not the thing that I built or whatever the next instance of it is that's better than mine is, but one that, you know, uh, fit the needs of that particular community and they could build their own, um, you know, build a sort of a liquid democracy principle into their governance, a direct interface for people to actually engage with their 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 local governance so that would be the the long-term rollout and how we could take over the world Ooh, so uh, does that answer the question uh uh process wise yes um uh i'm actually looking and and that's great uh the thing that i'm looking for is uh, uh essentially the marketing marketing uh rollout plan um so uh you know which municipalities have we contacted which professional organizations have we contacted where's what's our list of them uh which ones said yes or no uh which ones you know are we continuing to and uh, by the way i can also help you get in touch with david bovel yeah we, we know david um i'm thinking that outbound marketing isn't a thing that this needs to be focused on but rather inbound inbound awesome, awesome works so awesome that it's contagious yeah I, so I, I i apologize for using marketing as the term there uh, as a as a product development person what i've learned is that i build wonderful products and nobody uses them because i don't have uh, i don't I, I don't have a pr PR department. I don't have a marketing department. So what I mean probably more, more precisely is to use a business term again, which is kind of mis misaligned, but um, uh, where's our sales funnel? Um, you know, uh, we, you know, with list of uh, organizations and stuff have we developed uh, to actually roll out stuff. And by the way, Sam, I, I, a long time product developer, you probably know this too. Um, uh, you actually don't build stuff first, you ship it first, and then you build it. Um, so you ship to a couple customers, and then you you build a thing that you said that you ship to them, and then they use it. Uh, so and and doing it the other way is a waste of time, because uh, you need the thing actually being used before, uh, while you're actually even developing the first prototype, right? So um, I might suggest I, that we have a we've just survived a pandemic and uh, viral contagion might be a good metaphor here. So maybe we need to figure out who are our super spreaders as opposed to what is our sales funnel. Sorry, uh, Sam, you're going to you're going to reply. No, I, I just appreciate I appreciate Pete, uh, your perspective. I, I've, I've messed around with your products and I, you know, I, I, I know how much care you put into them and, and how well designed they are and um and and also i hear, I hear your frustration like I, I i i struggle with that you know that possibility of, of of the of that of that being the end result here as well and and so i don't know i i would love to i mean i have ideas about it i've identified users and i built the first product and gave it to people and you know some people loved it and some people hated it and i you know brought in the feedback and blah 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 so i'm you know, I'm, I'm, and, and part of why I'm here is I want your feedback. Like I, I want you guys, I want all of you guys, like I'll drop this whole thing in a second and work on something else. If you've got a better idea, like, let's talk about it. I, I, I'm trying to solve this problem of human coordination. I don't care how we get there. I'm not a guy with a product looking for a market. I'm like, there's a problem I'm trying to solve, you know? So, um, and, you know, I feel like the people in this group are, you know, smart and connected and insightful and you know and so that's why you know for me like getting you all into a room and saying how are we going to do this like that's exciting to me that's what i want that's why i'm here and you know i i and i, and I apologize like i like i don't want to talk about trump and i don't want to talk about kamala 
I want to talk about how are we going to do this because those people are not they're they're in, they're they're the they're the winners of the system that we built, and the system that we built has really serious birth defects. And I think we just need to start thinking about how to, um, you know, build something that wasn't designed when people in a town hall wrote down what the town hall wanted and brought it with a horse to the rep, you know, the representative brought it to the horse. Like, let's come up with something a little bit more, you know, sophisticated. And so um, like, what, what's it going to be? And, 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 and indeed, and I, and I definitely want to, talk about those things that you're saying like let's let's talk about marketing let's talk about who are our super spreaders let's let's do that you know when we have something that we're happy with and or even when we just have an idea that we like you know that's that's how i want to do it i am noting the time uh i'm happy that we're so energetic at this point we've lost a bunch of people to other other duties in the world uh but we're i would love to come back to this i it would be really great to to consider how to reformulate this question so that we have a, a, another productive call afterwards. So I'm, I'm happy to continue this topic in next week uh, and would love to figure out, actually next week might be, I think. So next week is the third of the month. And I think I said that we, we might, as an experiment, use the first uh, Thursday of the month as the check-in call. So by that, previous thought next Thursday would actually be a, the the only check-in call of October, uh, which may not be a bad idea to sort of obey that and then come back to this the week after. Does that make sense? We good with that? So I'll, I'll go to check-in next week uh, in, in our time-tested tradition, and then we'll come back to this. And let's Let's share stuff on the Mattermost channel. Let's, uh, you know, let's collaborate some in between to figure out where this might go. Feel free to go crazy on the Mattermost channel. It's a very good place for this conversation. I, we don't use Mattermost nearly as much as I, I wish we did. Um, so it'd be great to do that. And uh, with all that, Ken, might you have uh, uh, sequential words of I wisdom might. for us? I might. Um, I'll be gone next month. I'll be in Italy for uh, some of the first to the 25th. So my next call will be on Halloween. Um, a poem. Boy, this has been a tough I want to try and find something, but I'm going to go with Clearing by Martha Possilwaite. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently till the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize it and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. Would you please read that again? I will. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize it and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. That's just brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Sam, thanks for the heart I'll reaction. put it up on the, uh, on the list. Appreciate it, Ken. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, mm -hmm. Sam, you've catalyzed a good thing. Um, Hope you enjoyed it. Yep. I, I did. It was good. We'll be back uh, okay. next, next week, check in, but we'll, a week after that, we'll be back, back to this. So um, thanks for that. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Yeah.